Welcome back to the Athlete Hackers Podcast. My name is Chris Schrade. And I'm Mark Spellman. And today we have the privilege of having one of my friends and one of my former co-workers in the profession, Chris Hag Hagman. What's up, buddy? How are we doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks Glad for having me, Chris. So, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, before we start in with Chris, we'll uh, hit on the hi highlights or what I took away from the last uh, podcast. Uh, first, the one with uh, Coach Hall. Uh, the thing I took away from that one, uh, the big takeaway was that when you are being a recruited athlete, everything you do is being um, under a microscope. So yeah. make sure that you are being the best person you can be on a daily basis to those people that have poured into you so that when you get to the opportunity to be a recruited athlete, you do not mess up that opportunity. Recruiting coaches are ninjas. They are dressed so you don't recognize them, and they are watching. And they are asking everybody that comes in contact with you. So the custodian worker at your high school, they're being asked what kind of person you are. Do they say hello to you? Are you nice to them? So understand, everything counts. How do you treat everyone in your circle, not just your coaches or the people who are – uh, on the hierarchy, but how do you treat everyone else that is just normal people? That's that's what I they want to see. Be a good person. Don't be a douchebag. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, 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 and then the big takeaway from Sean Crawford was don't let difficulties in your life and hard times and setbacks in your life deflect you or deter you from your goals and always have a big goal at the end that you are going to work for every day to get better. Use adversity to grow. Yep. So those are my takeaways. And with that being said, my man, Hags, uh, I know Chris from our time at Fairfield University together. He was the assistant director of sports medicine. Uh, Currently, he is at Providence College as the head athletic trainer for the men's basketball program. He also has had stops at the University of Connecticut and at Davidson College. And with that being said, Chris, how are you? And give a little back uh, story to your uh, how you got to where you are now. Hello, everyone. Um, so how, how I got here, um, you know, in college, you know, a long, long time ago, not as long as Spellman, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew that I kind of wanted to be around sport. You know, it's, it's, it's paved the way for so much opportunity for me that it's my way of kind of giving back. And, you know, unfortunately, I knew that I wasn't going professional. Um, Where'd you go so, to school? I went to Ithaca College, played football at Ithaca for four years. Um, what position? You know, receiver. Um, it He's was, got it speed, was, man. Had, had. <laughs> so what, had what were you, 6'3", six, six, 200? 6'3", uh, 215, 210. Um, you know, and fortunate – to never really sustain any major injuries, but you know, you have minor stuff here and there and, you know, through the, through the sports medicine, athletic training route, you know, that just kind of kept me around. Um, and then after graduation, I did, did he actually did a year in, you know, internship at Colgate before I went to get my master's at UConn. And then from UConn, which I, you know, I worked for the football team there, you know, learned a lot, you know, it, Went there, obviously, it was, it was a great experience. You know, was able to get my master's covered, you know, through the GA program, but learned more in those two years than I, you know, I had in the four or five, you know, at U or at undergrad and my internship, just because it's eight year immersed it is sink or swim, you know, at that level. And Bob Howard, my former you know, head athletic trainer, you know, incredible teacher, was able to learn a lot um, when I was there, Coach Jerry Martin who was remarkable as a strength coach, just absolutely, you know, he was unbelievable. And, you know, um, 
So I was able to learn a lot from him and just see, see how he did it, you know, see how he does it, you know. And you know, um, from there, went to Fairfield, where I worked with women's soccer, men's lacrosse, which was, you know, it was great. You know, it was a great first step for me. And kind of, you know, you, you, you learn a lot. You learn more than you think you do at every job you're at. Um, and then from there, was fortunate to get the gig at Davidson, you know, working men's basketball. Um, you know, I did, did track and, and cross country from the men's side and also had some cheer, cheerleading coverage and also worked in the football program too. Um, which again, smaller settings from, from, you know, from the Connecticut days, but you get to learn a lot, you know, higher up you go in the, in the, in the you know, in the totem pole, you see more, learn more, do more. It's great. Um, but then my wife and I loved our time down there, but we knew we kind of wanted to get back to the Northeast. Um, we have some family up in the area. You know, when, when things change when you have kids. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to get the job at, at Providence and working with men's basketball. And it's, it's been great. You know, it's year two, well, 1.75, I guess, since you know, our, our season got cut short. Um, which really was a bummer because we were, we were clicking. We were on all cylinders and it was, I think we were destined for something special. Um, but that's, you know, that's life. You know, you don't always get the outcome that you want and you kind of keep going, you know, and like just to kind of echo what you talked about, what, what Sean had said is, yeah, everyone, everyone goes through stuff. And you can't let it get in your way. And, you know, you got to kind of keep, keep going. Time doesn't stop. So keep, keep on chugging. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to work with a lot of great people in my time and you learn that from people, you know, it's everyone has something going on that they need to take care of or, or, you know, that you might not understand. Um, but you still keep going and that's, that's kind of how I see it. And, you know, and, you know, now we're just trying to work on getting our, our student athletes back in a safe and orderly fashion. So we can kind of return where to some sort of relative normal. Where were you when they canceled the season? Were you down in New York? <laughs> We were on the bus uh, in the New York City, going to the going to Madison Square Garden, and they for said your first round right, game? for our first round game. And they said, <laughs> "All right, guys." And at that point, you know, I mean, we kind of knew it was going to happen. Um, you know, we were the last last major conference to to stop it. We actually started the Big East. Actually, started it. They got a game, two games in that first night, and then I half of the first game, and then ours got canceled. So, and, that, and then we returned, and it was, it was pretty surreal. You know, we, you know, again, we knew it was happening. We didn't know at that point about the NCAA the tournament. Well, we heard about it actually on the bus ride home, got home, back to Providence, and that was the last I saw my seniors, you know, which is, which is weird kind of thing you know and we had our moments of goodbye in the locker room and you know at that point I've only had those guys for two years but you know when you're that close two years seems like a long time and then we've had zoom meetings kind of <clears throat> every week as we go with the team currently and then when you have that first zoom meeting and your seniors aren't there it's, it, it was it was wild it was just a really weird you know surreal situation that that is like man I'm not going to get the chance to, to say goodbye to my guys in person because hopefully most of them go on and pl play at some level, you know, but again, what that level will be, who knows when it happens, who knows? So, so yeah. What, um, all right. So for people that don't know, uh, I was the director of strength and conditioning at Fairfield university. So I oversaw the strength and conditioning program for all 20 programs, all 400 athletes. And Chris was the assistant director for the strength, uh, for the athletic training sports medicine side. So talk a little bit about the differences in what we do and the similar and the similarities of what we do and how, I mean, how idea, what would be the ideal situation that you would see as like a sports performance uh, model? Um. <laughs> I mean, first and foremost, I, you know, for me personally, and I and, you know a lot of my coworkers are the same or my colleagues are the same, but they're all the outliers. I, I do think that the relationship are always important, you know, with your athletes, with your coaches, with your coworkers, but the sports medicine to strength and conditioning 
groups, I think is one of the most important relationships that you can have. It needs to be there. Um, that trust needs to be there. That communication needs to be there because, you know, unfortunately my, I get better at my job when people get injured is trying to get in and, you know, get them back to a point where they're able to get back on the field. But we're limited in a sense because we'll be working on whatever injured body part there is. And then that goes, then you parlay that into the strength and conditioning. And we both have to be able to communicate and work and look out what's best for the student athlete. And that's, that's the biggest thing, you know, there's always going to be pressures, you know, kid gets injured. All right, got to get back, got to get back. You know, um, kids go home for the summer, spend coaches have to make sure they've got the right program for each person. Um, you know, so there's always pressures coming from, you know, the coaching staff, there's pressures coming from the general public. There's pressure coming from the kids that want to get back, but it's, it's us, you know, the, the, the sports medicine and the strength conditioning departments that are kind of behind the scenes. You know, if our faces are seen, that's not a great thing. You know, they don't, they don't want to, people don't want to, I don't want to know, I don't want people to know who I am because that means I'm doing my job right. Um, and, you know, and, and the same thing I think with, with most strength coaches, you know, there are some that, like to have their name out there, which is, which is fine, you know, and there's different higher profile, you know, some of those SEC schools, some of the profiles and they're out in front, but, you know, for that one person, there's four or five behind them that are helping them, you know, and that's the big thing. So, you know, at the end of the day, the most important piece is getting this, your student athlete or your athlete or, or whoever it is back on the field at a high, high level. And that starts with the communication between the strength, the strength coach and the athletic trainer. Um, you know, so I've always, I've always tried to maintain a relationship slash friendship or whatever it is with your strength coach, because it's important, you know, and there's going to come a time where you're going to disagree uh, with how things go, but you need to trust that the strength coach knows what they're doing. And the strength coach needs to trust that you know what you're doing so that you don't kind of conflict. And, you know, there's going to be headbutting. There's going to be, you know, a strength coach might want to push a little bit and, and that's your job, but you have to do it in a safe manner. And, you know, I think we're the sports medicine department is kind of that safety net for the kid. Um, but at the same time, the strength coaches are also there to help push it a little bit so you don't get complacent. And it's, it's a really interesting dynamic. And, but, I, you know, back to what I said before, I think that's quite possibly the most important relationship that you have. You know, um, when I was, when I came down, I was training Mark. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one specific time, <clears throat> Mark was like, Hey, come walk with me for a minute. And he brought me through the athletic room or the athletic training room, you know, and it's like an assembly line, you know, you've, mm -hmm. you've got your, your ice baths and all your tables <laughs> and all, all your equipment. And there's all kinds of, uh, kids in there from different sports getting taped up or rehab. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting for me because, I, you know, I came from a division school, uh, division two school. We took care of our own strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. And I think it was only towards like my senior year, um, UB had a chiropractic school and they started getting some of the people that were involved in that program to come in as, as trainers and, you know, to help rehab us and tape us up and things like that. But what impressed me most was the communication because it was – I don't remember the actual conversation, but I just remember it was, you know, Mark just in passing talking to one of the athletic trainers. It might have even been you, Chris, but mm -hmm. it was a conversation about a particular athlete and how they were doing and um, what stage, you know, they were in. And it was very interesting to me because um, I never, that was the first time I experienced it. I never saw the connection between strength and conditioning and, um, and uh, the athletic training team. Um, not to put the two of you on the spot, uh, and you know, but I'm going. But, you, but you're going to. Yeah, why not? Exactly. Not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. Yeah. Um, can you talk about a specific case? Maybe may not mentioning names, or maybe just kind of uh, just a, for an example, um, uh, an injury that happens and the connection that the two of you would 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 have back and forth. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not. It's not. Again, it's not rocket science. It's, you know, so the, the injury takes place, you know, and, you know, Mark and I have had our, our, our fair share of athletes that have gotten injured, whether it was lacrosse or, or soccer. Um, you know, you, you previously had 
one of our athletes on to speak and you know she tore acl um and and it's, it's never it's never great however you know i'll take the early on stages working with their knee and i was working with her knee specifically um but then you know it's not just the knee because as you know long any long-term injury they're going to have to work on that body part but you can't forget about the rest and so there's not enough time in the day for the athletic trainer to make sure they're focused on every body part so whereas i'm working on the knee i then talk with mark and say okay mark he or she is at a point where they can start doing stuff in the weight room these are the restrictions I'll let you do what you what you want to do. And typically, he would go and run with he or whoever the strength coach would do is like, okay, I got it. But it's not just I got it. It's uh, you know, then he'll return with, okay, well, what do you think about this? You know, and I'm I'm not going to dictate what Mark will do or the strength coach will do. That's not my job. That's not you know. And I think too many times, and I've seen it, and I, and, I, and I've I've been a part of it. That ego gets in the way. You know, as we mentioned, talking beforehand that, no, I can do this. I can do this. Well, that's, that's the problem I think that many people have is that they try to do too much. So again, back to that, you know, and trust Mark to, to do the other stuff, you know, while I'm working on this one body part, he can do so much more and help them, you know, cause you can't just focus on that one spot and they're, they're going to be good to go. It doesn't work that way. So and, if, if just, just kind of break it down in a crude way, yep. the relationship yep. um, is, Essentially, what the athletic trainer's job is to do is kind of to dictate the intensity. Is that accurate? Uh, I wouldn't say the in, the intensity. It, it's it's just to give more more guidance, you know, and and you know, say say it's a knee injury, you know, I, I don't want them doing lower body right now, so you start with upper body, or you know, upper body and core, or upper body and uninjured leg, you know, just that's that's kind of. I'll give those basic guidelines and then Mark will kind of do his thing. The strength coach will do their thing. And this is what we're going to do. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, mean, I, think it, I, think, I think it's a daily conversation that we have <laughs> and not only daily, but it might even be every couple hours <laughs> and it's a give and take, you know, the, the sports medicine, strength and conditioning departments, we're at the end of the day, we're overseed by a medical doctor and we have to follow their guidelines. And then it's up to Chris to take care of for the athletic trainer to take care of the affected area and give the strength and conditioning coach the parameters within to work with, with that injured athlete. And then kind of let us do our job. I mean, And if I ever have questions or concerns about what I'm doing, I go back to, I'd go back to Chris or the athletic trainer and be like, okay, so this is what I was thinking today. I don't know what you're doing as far as the rehab goes or the rehabilitation goes. So what are you doing with them? You know, where are we as far as walking? Are we walking? Are we running? Are we doing change of direction? Are we doing any uh, plyometrics? You know, where are we as far as workload with the affected mm-hmm. area? And then it's up to me to kind of complement mm-hmm. what they're doing in the training room and, and, and do what we can in the, in the weight room. So you know, and then, I'm assuming, obviously, this is done in phases early on. If you mm-hmm. can't, um, if it's a knee injury, you can't do mm-hmm. lower body. He's just doing upper body. But as that athlete starts to progress, is there more feedback coming from the strength and conditioning side as to whether the injury seems to be getting stronger? If there's certain directions that are, you know, change, if there's a change of direction, you know, whether they can, they're having, they're, they're, they can go forward, but they can't go backward. Is that the kind of conversations that are happening mm-hmm. on later on? It definitely, yeah. I mean, early on is, it, earlier on is easy. Um, that's, that's, that's when it's, it's most black and white. It's kind of when you get to the middle and late stages that that's where, you know, the, you know, the communication is almost, almost more important because, you know, say it's, you know, let's say it's a lower body injury there. I will be doing lower body functional stuff, whether it's plyometric, whether it's, whether it's, um, you know, some sprint stuff, whether it's this, but there's also the workload balance, you know? And so if, if Mark has a plan of doing this today, I'm not going to do the same thing or, or and, and, and vice versa, because, you, you know, there's, there is an overuse component and that's, 
that's where it, that's where they get. I think the communication and the relationship is 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 instrumental in in what you're doing. Um, you know, and if strength coach X has a way of doing something, you have to be be able to as an athletic trainer adapt your ways a little bit so that the, the student athlete isn't isn't getting overworked and and, and vice and vice versa. You have to. It, it's it's always going to be a fluid situation, a fluid relationship. Um, you know. Typically, with, like with Mark and I, I'd go down to his office, we'd chat, or I'd send him an email with with an update, and if he had any questions, he'd ask me, um, and then we'd say, you know, this is what he's doing, this is what she's doing, you know, so you can you can go with that, and then as we get later, later in in the progression, I do less, he does more, you know, so it, it just it just that's kind of how how it works as it goes over time, and then we kind of continue, you know, and and one of the things that athletic trainers tend to look at a little bit more in depth is going to be, you know, how their body's reacting. Um, you know, strength coaches can get, rarely are collegiate strength coaches able to have one-on-one -on -one access because just, just because of numbers, you know, it's not, there's one, sometimes two, in most cases, it's not, you know, some of the bigger schools have three or four to cover a team, one strength coach for, for majority of athletes so they can't watch everything hmm. we get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one basic so mark i was noticing when i was doing stuff she was her knee was bending in some stuff so could just keep an eye on that and then and then he would and then he would kind of fire back and same thing with any strength coach i've ever had i was like hey you know i'm noticing that she's got or he's got a weak kind of or a deficiency in their glute and when when they're going on a squat their knee is bending in or or whatnot and so then he would prescribe some some you know exercises that are going to focus on that and and so it, it's like i said it, it's all it's all about communication and that's the biggest thing and you know we do similar stuff in in, a, in in that sense but kind of our vehicles are different if that makes well, sense you know i think the, i think the other thing is is like you know as you said in the early part of an injury it is pretty clear cut it's black and white and I think as you get later into the, the process, a lot of it is kind of holding back the athlete because the athlete, at some point, the athlete feels like they're ready to go. And it's like, you're not ready to go yet, mm. but, it, but it doesn't hurt anymore. Okay, I understand it doesn't hurt anymore, but you're not meeting these benchmarks. Like mm -hmm. these are the things, and that, it's actually what, you know, Goody talked about. Um, She's like, you would always – dangle the carrot in front of her to, to hit the benchmarks that she needed to hit in order to play again. I mean, mm -hmm. at the, I mean, she, she, she said it herself, she just wanted to kick a ball. Mm -hmm. I mean, so like you would, I, you know, knowing you and knowing her and our relationship, you know, I, I see, I would see you work in the ball into the rehab program to keep her engaged in the process and i think a lot of people don't understand that it's like like you're dealing with an athlete that you know traditional injury for an acl is eight to nine months mm -hmm. you know to get back i mean i would say it's probably to fully get back it's probably more a calendar year mm -hmm. um from from the injury just to be safe not everybody not everybody's adrian no. peterson and can come back in six months <laughs> nor should they um but i think you know one of the things that i i, I want to talk about because a lot of people don't understand the difference between what you do and what i do mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people have it you know unfortunately the word trainer yeah um that's out in the general public they don't understand the difference between an athletic trainer and a strength and conditioning coach mm -hmm. where you have a lot of people who are trainers but they they're not athletic trainers or they're trainers but they're not strength and conditioning coaches and that's where i think or they they, tra they train athletes in a gym and they call themselves athletic trainers yeah exactly yeah, Once there's, there's no there's no medical background to it but but and, and that's the vernacular that everybody uses and i think it needs to change so that people in our profession understand that there's a difference and there's letters behind our names that make us different for what we do for the people that we work with. So mm -hmm. give a little give a little background on your education and what 
what's the difference between outside of outside of what's the difference basically between what we do <laughs> for the general public that doesn't understand so, the, yeah. uh, so my background um and it, i mean if i were to go, go back to school now it would be different than it was you know 15 or so years ago um but there's exercise physiology there's physiology there's anatomy um you know i always refer to athletic trainers as, as as jack of all trades master of none um we have we have a lot of tools in our belt that we have to be able to use you know there's a little bit of nutritional stuff there's a little bit of i mean there's a lot of bit of anatomy there's a lot of bit of you know the physiology and how the body reacts to things um you know so there, there's slightly more of a medical background than there is in the true or you know strength conditioning world the, the really good strength and conditioning coaches have that background also but they just focus more on exercise prescription and and progressions and you know things like that um whereas we are more you know triage based um kind of a middleman of sorts where we're going to do the initial evaluation of after an athlete gets injured and then figure out where they need to go is it something that we can take care of in the house do they need to go see the, um the doctor the orthopedic surgeon or or is this just this isn't much and they continue on the way in, in terms of working with the strength coach to continue to get them stronger um you know we we Athletic trainers will strengthen specific body parts and return that from injury. Strength conditioning coaches focus more on the entire entirety of the body to get them prepped and ready to go for, you know, a 14 game season, uh, you know, 20 game soccer season. And it's, you know, it's, 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 there are a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences in what we do, you know, and that's, that's, the, that's the biggest thing. But, Again, it, it all comes back to the, you know, we have to work together. And so I think that's kind of why the two get meshed together because, you know, collegially and professionally, we do work so close. And so and we're just two little pieces in the, you know, in the, in the puzzle that is athletics. Um, but well, no, again, I, we have. I think, I think, I think you hit it right on the head. The, the, the athletic departments that are most successful their their strength and conditioning and their sports medicine mm -hmm. basically work hand in hand, not one over the other. No. It, it's it's so, and 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 with the guideline of we're doing what's best for the athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's what's going to help this athlete be the best that they can be, not only at their sport, but you know, going forward in life. Like how mm -hmm. how can we impact them in the four years that we have them. So that when they leave the, you know, when they leave our care, that they can be the best person that they can be on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So, so um, obviously we've got this connection going on um, in the Division One schools. Um, mm -hmm. Do you guys see that this is a trend that's going on D1, D2, maybe even D3, um, and in high school, or is it just on that major level? No, I, I think that, you know, again, it, it, everything has this trickle down effect. And, you know, athletic trainers are, you know, and, and, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm partial, but we are extremely important in the athletic world. Um, you know, and, and we're not lifesavers, but we do save lives. And there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, there's so many high schools that don't have athletic trainers. Um, that's starting to become less and less which is which is huge um you know strength coaches i think in the high school level aren't as numerous i would say um just because it's, it's a challenging you know unless you know some of these giant athletic um powerhouses that will put the money into strength conditioning which is which would be great if you had one but typically strength coaches double as the football coach or they double as whatever, which is good that you have some sort of guidance. But then I think sometimes that comes back to, are they a true strength conditioning coach or are they just, they have a background and they, and they 
use it. Yeah, and you don't have uh, someone focusing on it. You've got a you don't have correct. a specialist. You got to you know play multiple roles. Yeah, yep. well, and, and, and even even on the higher level though, like you know, it's whereas athletic trainers used to do, um, you know, the injury evals, the little nutritional stuff. They would do psychology stuff more and more collegially those positions are becoming full-time positions where you're going to have a team nutritionist. You're going to have a sports psychologist. You're going to have the athletic trainer. You're going to have the strength coach. You're going to have, you know, you could have a strength coach. Then you could have a second performance coach working on something else or a speed coach. And that is definitely going down the, down the chain. You know, it's not as prevalent in the D2 or D3. Uh, I, would, I would actually venture a guess that there's almost more in D3 than D2. Um, just from my experiences. Um, but I think that's starting to go down into the high school levels, which I think is important. And that's why I think it's also important that, you know, the general public know about athletic trainers and they know about strength and conditioning coaches. And when parents are looking for someone to straight to train their, their child, you know, there's, there's training for looks and there's training for function. Hmm. You want to make sure you get someone who trains for function. Yep. And it's not just because I want to, I want to bench 400 pounds or I want to let go of my shirt off or, or whatever. It's what's going to get you better prepared to play your sport. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that's what I think parents need to understand and realize that it is this, you know, and, and, and that's what you, you know, it's funny to take it away, you know, go away from sport. My brother hurt his back a couple months ago and I was, I, I was getting frustrated with him because he wasn't necessarily reaching out to me trying to do it on his own, you know, I, you know, I suggested some things and, you know, he just didn't realize that he could, you know, ask for an MRI, you know, ask his doctor to pr- prescribe an MRI or call in questions that are simple for us in the sports medicine world, even the strength conditioning world, they don't know, you know, but just as, just as, you know, he works in, in the business side, there are so many things I don't know, but I don't ask questions. So it's parents need to realize, ask questions, ask, ask questions, you know, what do you, what do you, what, what's your background? What are you going to do with my child? And if they just say, I'm gonna get him stronger. Well, how, why, you know, and I think that's really important, you know, and it just, just as important as if someone gets injured, don't, don't push them through it because that can have long lasting effects. And that's, that's the thing that I think we're seeing more and more. And I think, you know, we're talking about the, the carrot being dangled in front of you. Everyone talks about scholarships. Everyone talks about going to the league. Everyone, that's all they think about. So they just, they, they specialize. And I think, and, and I've seen this in a lot of, you know, Dr. James Andrews has talked about it. Um, you know, spe- specialization in, you know, in younger athletes is what is a driving force into shorter careers. Because overuse, whether it's, whether it's shooting 10,000 free throws, which is a small, you know, a small sample size, you're going to get a shoulder issue. If that's all you're doing is shooting, you're, you know, you're going to have issues. If you're pitching, you know, all you're doing is throwing and throwing and throwing, and that's not a natural motion for your body. If you're not doing, if you're not giving your body time to recuperate and regenerate and move in different functions and patterns, that body part is just going to go, you know, and that's the thing that we're seeing more and more. And people wonder why their career is cut short or, you know, their injury, quote unquote, injury prone. It's because it's the only thing you've ever done. You're, at some point, something's got to give way. So, you know, and, I, and I've, you know, I've spoken with coaches, and it's, it's interesting to see. And I think, I think Nick Saban has come out and said it before. Like, he, you know, when he's when he's looking for his next football players, he's looking for people who have done multiple sports. So it's not just one. So your body is coming in trained in different ways, so that you're able to withstand the pressures of the football season. So that it's not just an overuse thing. And by the time they're, you know, juniors and seniors, their body's shot. Um, you know, it's but interesting yeah. um, going back a little bit when you were yeah. talking about the importance of an athletic trainer. <clears throat> I started having flashbacks to when I was playing, and you know, you're not only important in um, the physical sense, but also psychologically. Mm-hmm. And then, and then you mentioned sports psychologists, and I started thinking about it a little more. I'm like, you know, that that that's interesting, but they must be focusing more on performance type of stuff. But when you're sitting there with an an injury you're isolated from the team mm-hmm. you know you don't get to play you don't get to mm-hmm. participate in practices uh you're kind of on an island and the only person you have to kind of 
be with you as that athletic trainer sometimes. Mm -hmm. you, you must have to constantly deal with the psychology of a, mm -hmm. of a person, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that matter. Yeah, we do. Um, you know, we joke about it, you know, in, in our offices and stuff. And everywhere I've always been. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's you know that's the that's the running joke is that you know we should have we should all have our own kind of couch in our offices so the kids can come and, and lay down. But it, um, it but it's beyond what a sports psycho psychologist can do, right? Because you it, it, it is. you're you're on the front line there yep. with that yep. you know with that mental health issue, especially yep. which is huge now, which is huge, and you know for so long it's been so suppressed, you know, and it's again. Many of the issues that we face today aren't new. They're just being talked about more hmm. and they're being understood more. You know, and that's, I think that's the biggest thing. And it's, you know, it's, and it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. Um, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, working at Providence right now, one of the big things that you know, John Rock, who was one of my bosses, um, I replaced him as the athletic trainer for men's basketball. He's been here for a long, long time. You know, he, his his big big phrase is "You're never alone in Friartown," and, and it, you know we've got shorts on. You know, it's it's just to make the kids realize that you're never alone. You know, things are you know, you play long enough, you're going to get injured. That's the way the world works. You know, law of averages. You know, the more you do something, the more likely that something's going to happen. Um, and so it's not just about getting them back to sport. It's you know, how's your day? What's going on? Um, you know, it, it's, it, so the kids feel comfortable with you and they, you have to have that relationship so you're able to talk about stuff. And, and you know, sometimes kids are afraid to talk to their coaches because they're afraid they're going to be perceived as weak if they have an injury. And that, you know, it's not always about just rehabbing an injury. It's just, you know, Hey, how's it going? What's going on? Um, cause kids are going to have good days and kids are going to have bad days. Just like, just like any one of us have good days and bad days. I don't have but, bad you know, days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think it, as an athlete, it was also comforting to understand yep. what was going on too. Yep. You know, you yep. talk to your athletic trainer, you find mm -hmm. out what's going mm -hmm. on on the inside, how long mm -hmm. things take, you mm -hmm. know, because you, you're, you're essentially, you're involved with it as, as the athlete, you're trying to heal yourself and you that, expertise that you're you're getting back is you know it's it's medicine hey, buddy. <laughs> my, my guy's making an appearance <laughs> um no it, it it is and that's that that you know giving the kids an idea of how long you know and sometimes we it's it it's better to um oversell the, the, the time and then you know get them back faster rather than say you're going to be back you know whether you know you're back in in three weeks and it, it, it's a you know a six-week deal because mm. that that becomes challenging um but you know mark to your point you're talking about before with with, with with beauty you know yeah acls are nine months and the hard part is at four months if not sooner they're running so in their mind oh, I, I can run well yeah you can run but that's not everything and you have to be the, you know, the constant reminder and oftentimes the bad guy, you have to be the bad guy and, and rein them in, you know, cause they, most athletes want to get better. Every now and then you'll get a kid who is okay with just going slow, which is, which is fine. That's, that's their prerogative. But a lot of the elite athletes, they want to push, push, push. And just because they can, they think they can, they can run, they're ready. And that's, it's my job to tell them. And it's my job to communicate with the strength coaches and, and the strength coaches to, to echo it. Cause you can't, you can't be given two different stories. And so again, back to, back to the importance of the relationship that you have. And, you know, Mark, I've told, I've told athlete X that this is going to be six to nine months, probably closer to nine. Okay. I got you. You know, you know, they can't, be, you can't be whispering a different, story to the athletes that then that becomes an ugly, yeah, ugly, not, ugly situation. I'm not, I'm yeah. not going behind you and going, Oh, we'll yeah. be good in four months. Yeah. You know, and if you give me mm -hmm. a, if you give me a range, like you said, six to nine months, I'm going to say nine, mm -hmm. I'm going to get six out of there. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like Chris told me six to nine. I'm like, yeah. it's probably going to be nine. So let's, yeah. you know, let's not, let's slow cook this yeah. um, instead of, instead of microwave it. 
but also the importance, like you said, it's, a, it's about the relationship that we not only have between our departments, but the ones that we have with the athletes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's been situations where, you know, you've worked with somebody, you've told, you've told the athlete something, and they've gotten a different story from probably the strength coach or maybe even another athletic trainer that you work with. Mm-hmm. Or or the athlete has gone on to freaking Google mm-hmm. to see how, how long they should be back. How mm-hmm. do you deal with, you know, maybe misinformation that the athlete gets from an outside source? It could be mom or dad. I mean, it could it, be anybody. It is. Um, you know, this day and age, there's, there's a lot of mom and dad in the, in the, in the equations. Um, but it, it, it's, it's about the relationship you know, and the communication with the athlete, they have to know that you, you know, you have to be confident in what you're saying. You can be confident in what you're selling, you know, and I know that I'm, I, I'm not, you know, the foremost authority on sports medicine injuries, but when I'm talking to my athletes, I'm going to be confident in what I'm saying, you know, and I'll ask, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not big enough, I'm not too big to ask for help. And I think a lot of people get in trouble that way because they think they can do it and, that can cause an issue that can cause conflict with, with the athletes. If, if you're kind of telling them, no, if, you know, if you're, if you're yelling at them saying, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's about the communication. It's about the conversation. You need to have the conversation with your athlete and say, this is what we're doing. And I, I understand what you're coming, where you're coming from, but this is the plan that a, our doctors have laid out. B, this is why we're doing it. And C it's, it's for your, for your greater good, you know, and they'll get mad at you at some point, but, they get over that and that's you know again it's, it's about having that relationship and it's about having that com- communication and conversation with those kids i think the, that, one of the interesting things that have come up a few times in these uh, podcasts speaking to former athletes is that that 18 to 22 year old age mm-hmm. they don't know what they're doing and then they realize mm-hmm. it you know afterwards after they mm-hmm. leave they, they realize what you guys did for them mm-hmm. and how much you actually did know more than they did mm-hmm. Yeah. Just something to keep in mind if you're in that age group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen to us, us elder statesmen. Um, but no, not and it's funny that way, you know. And there are times I've had I've had disagreements with athletes, but tomorrow's a new day, and you you know you can't let that. They're gonna harness their frustrations longer than you will. You can't let that. You can't let your frustrations affect how you're dealing with your athletes. Mm. Um, you might get frustrated. They might be late. They might not be complicit with what you're doing. Um, however, you have to keep going. You have to keep pushing them to get the best out of them, but safely. And they can't necessarily. They might be upset. They might not. They might not like it. But if you keep going in with that positive energy that next day, you 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 move on. You, know, you can't be kind of looking back and saying, "Oh, he missed his rehab appointment, and I'm not. I'm done with him." Well, no, it doesn't work that way because you still have to be the person there for them. And like I said, or you know, like we've talked about before, is that kind of psychology component. They could be having something else going on they haven't talked about, and that that could be the reason why they're acting the way that they're acting. And then you kind of keep just keep at it, keep going, keep going, keep going, and you come out better on the backside um, than you would have if they just go off on their own. You know, and that's you know, there are you know, but. Also, there are times where kids do go off on their own and sometimes you do get adverse reactions and sometimes they, they come back in, in a good way. And then you can't be upset about that. You know, you might be upset that they went a different avenue, but at the end of the day, it's for what's, what's best for the kid. And that's, that's what you kind of have to swallow your pride sometimes and, 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 and understand that. I have before. So, so athlete, athletes miss rehab? Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> um, so I'm an incoming basketball player uh, to Providence. Take mm-hmm. me through the steps that I I need to go through before I get on campus, and probably like what mommy and daddy need to know when I first get there. Like what what are the steps that I need to take in order to be there, and then follow through on that. Like maybe the four year career of one of the players um i mean you can take it even back to fairfield like we, i mean it's, it's all it really is it's all, it's all the same i mean you know for the most part 
you know, when you're at the higher level programs, you know, say it's Providence, um, even, even the, you know, some of the smaller mid majors too, but when you get there, you know, you, you've got to, there is some stuff you have to have with you. You know, you've got, you know, get your health history together, get your immunizations, get all the stuff, all the pertinent information um, together. And, you know, coming in, I need, I, you know, as the sports medicine department, I need you to be honest with me with what your health history is. If you've, if you've torn your ACL, if you've done something, or if you've had an injury, a significant injury, it doesn't necessarily require a surgery, but the more information that you give to us, it helps us do what's best for you. You know, you'll come in, you'll get a physical from our team physicians, um, our orthopedics, our general meds, um, and then, we, you know, we'll get a baseline of where you're at strength-wise, and then, okay, you've got a loose shoulder. We're going we're going to avoid, you know, overhead presses. We're going to avoid certain, certain exercises as to not make that worse. If, if your shoulder is chronically loose, we can chronically loose. We can do exercise to help tighten that up a little bit. But we need to know that so that when you come to me and you, then you go to the strength coach, you're not just going to make that injury worse. So that I think that's the biggest thing, you know, from my standpoint is when you come to campus, you know, you're not going to, you know, hiding something, you're not going to, it's going to hurt you more than it helps you, especially because you're, you're, you're here, you're ours, you're on campus. You are now the next four years, you are our student athletes that we treat with respect and almost as if you're one of our children. And that's kind of how I always see it. You know, you're going to be taken care of. Um, so honesty is, is paramount because you need to, we need to know what your limitations are early on so that we can work on those weaknesses, you know, and, and that's the one thing that it's not just about whether it's me or whether it's the strength and conditioning coach, it's not just about making you stronger. It's what's going to make you the best athlete that you can do, you know, and high schools don't necessarily have that access because you, you don't have them, you know, I'm basically on call 24 seven. Um, you know, and strength coaches are, are almost never not in the office at this level. Um, so again, if some, we need to work on something, that, that's where we find out. You know, if, you know, you get injured while you're here, you're going to get taken care of. That, that, that's, that goes without saying, and we, we can make adjustments there. But it's almost more important that we know what your history is when you come in so that we can get you started. You know, because year one – you're not going to be doing what year three guys are doing because every strength coach, every collegiate strength coach has, has their own plan, has their own program. And there are 9 million ways to skin the cat. And, and, you know, that's what we also need to realize that just because you, I might not agree with some of the stuff that Mark did, but that's not my, my room. That's not my, that's his room. I would, I would, I don't agree with it because I did something different, but that doesn't mean my, I'm right and he's wrong and vice versa. And that, you know, so that's, we need to kind of, you need to understand that, you know, and there's more, you know, everyone does it a different way. Yeah. I think like, I think, you know, that's been one of the big things I've talked with a bunch of coaches in the last couple of months, you know, and, and I, I keep going back to the, you know, the answer is four. Yeah. And how we get there differs yep. for everybody. So C plus two. Some it's eight minus four. Sometimes yeah. it's square root of sixteen. Yeah. Um, so I I think probably not as much in your profession, but more in my profession. You know, just understand that there's different methodologies and there's mm -hmm. ways to get what you're trying to do. You know, most mm -hmm. of the athletes go to school to play their sport. They're not mm -hmm. going there to be an Olympic lifter, power lifter, mm -hmm. or a crossfitter. They're going there to play their sport at the highest level possible. So mm -hmm. whatever you do with them, make sure that you have that as the base of what you're doing with the athletes. Getting mm -hmm. back to the screening process, are you working in collaboration with the strength and conditioning staff to go like through a functional movement screen? Are they doing no. like a year two max? I mean, you don't no, you know. Not really. Not, you know, some places do. You know, it's all about resources, you know, and that, that it's, a, it's a challenging thing to do. And it, it is, you know, VO2 max would be great, but unless you have an exercise physiologist on, on, on staff, you're, you're not going to get the, you know, the true accurate readings. 
Um, you know, it, you can go through some functional movement stuff, but I do think that, you know, from the screening standpoint, and I mean, a, a lot of places do do that, you know, for us, we'll, we'll, we'll do a general, you know, quick kind of ortho screen from the orthopedic uh, physicians um, where they'll, you know, kind of check shoulder stability, check, you know, knee laxity, check, you know, spinal alignment, check this kind of stuff. Um, and then when we read about your, your health, your specific health history, we'll, you know, look, oh, he had, he tore his hamstring in 10th grade or, you know, quad muscle and, or, or if he has a history of some lower body injuries, well, I would look at those and say, okay, well, why is that? And I, you know, a lot of it comes back to weak glutes where, you know, just because you're squatting doesn't mean your, your glutes are, are getting stronger. Just because you can, you know, squat a house doesn't mean, you know, it, it's the finite muscles that protect us from, from injury. Um, so we would look at those more so than, than, you know, the, the, you know, your, your bench and your squats, you know, everyone loves those numbers, but functionally there's so many more exercises that are more important. Um, and that, that's kind of where me specifically would, would go with, you know, if a kid, you know, again, kid came back and, you know, he tore, tore his ACL and as a junior and he's, and he's back to full, well, let's make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, so you kind of almost take a step back and where you would start to make sure you have that, that, that base, you know, cause you can, you can build a $9 million home on sand, but guess what? It's still on sand and the base sucks. So what's the, what's the purpose? Um, and so that, that, that's where it's, you know, again, one of the, one of the great things about with, with me specifically with work with men's basketball, I have 15 athletes. And so it's a lot easier for me to have to do that. Whereas you have a football team, you've got 110 so that's, that's one of the things I love about my job specifically is that, that, you know, I can focus just on my, my, you know, 12 to 15 guys. And they, they have, they have a designated strength coach just for men's basketball as well. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, he, he is, he is the head um, and oversees his, but basketball is, you know, and he, he, I think he works with men's soccer also, but okay. again, it's not, not challenging. We have, we have, four strength coaches yeah four strength coaches name them yeah <laughs> um yeah so um speaking of um kind of giving uh parents and college hopefuls uh, another heads up um mm -hmm. i imagine it's probably easier for both of you to work with an athlete who understands the body a little more, mm -hmm. who understands um, mm -hmm. lifting weights and conditioning uh, rather than someone who, who is just coming in. Because we've talked to a number of uh, previous Fairfield U uh, collegiate standouts that had no experience in weight training whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And just mm -hmm. as we were talking before, you know, you're talking about um, – uh, prescribing or, or prescribing against certain exercises. I think mm -hmm. you mentioned um, mm -hmm. a military press or something mm -hmm. like that for someone mm -hmm. with a shoulder injury. Mm -hmm. Well, if someone doesn't know what a military press is and they're coming into college and they're told not to, and you, you're in a strength um, room with, mm -hmm. you know, 20 or 30 other athletes, I'm sure the strength coach is probably watching out for that, but there's only so much mm -hmm. he could do. So you as an athlete are accountable to know this mm -hmm. stuff. And if you're told that you shouldn't be doing this, then you should have a heads up and a sense for what you can and can't do. I mean, at, you know, at this level, that's not, that's not a, that's not a concern um, because we would have that communication with the strength coach and that just wouldn't be on their, their card, mm -hmm. you know, whatever has been prescribed, you know, or, or you know, whatever program, you know, Mark or, you know, Kenny White, who I work with, with now um they just wouldn't do it and you know that so it would it wouldn't be in their repertoire of exercises for that reason because unfortunately you can't always trust the kids to do the right thing when, yeah. when it comes to that stuff um you know and, and again you, you there is only so much that you can do you can you know you can lead the horse to water but you can't always make a drink um but again, you, you, you focus on, and, and, it, and it, you know, say I've got a kid now, I, I had a kid last year who, you know, 
had a torn labrum in his shoulder. And there were exercises that I made sure that he avoided, you know, whether it was a deep bench because you're opening up the shoulder, overhead stuff, because, you know, you don't need the head of the of the humerus to kind of shift on, on that labrum. And Coach White, was, you know, he would kind of, he would work around it so that we could do some stuff that wasn't necessarily in that, in that plane. And that's the one thing that, you know, with the good strength coaches that there are so many exercises that can work the same muscles without doing the same movement. And that, again, there's an educational piece to it. You know, you have, you have to communicate to your athlete and say, this is why we're doing this. You know, in, in my experiences, when you tell a kid, no, you can't do this, they want to do it. But if you explain to them why, this is happening, then they then it kind of processes, you know, and you treat them as 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 adults, and you and you explain to them this is what we're doing, um, and why we're limiting you this, and they're like, oh, okay, you know, and it's once they realize it's for their better good, then, then then great, you know, and once you get with your athletes, once you get them to realize that, you know, again, yeah, the bench press, everyone loves it, you know, how much how much what's your bench? It's not, you know, the most functional thing, especially for a basketball player. You know, how often is it going to be pushing off on someone that, you know, so you you worry about other other exercises, the strength and stuff that's going to, again, back to our original concept is make you the most functional athlete that you can be. So, and that's, you know, yeah. Chris, let me ask you yep. Uh, yep. in terms of injury and Mark, mm -hmm. you in terms of bettering someone's performance, uh, is it easier to work with an athlete, does an athlete who knows their body well and knows these kind of modalities, are they, do they heal from injury faster and are they able to increase their performance better if they have more of a background in this stuff? Yeah, uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, um, you know, you, it's great to have an athlete that understands <clears throat> and who has put the time in to realize, you know, to be in tune with his body. Mm -hmm. But sometime an athlete, sometimes an athlete who is too in tune with his body, they think that everything that they feel is, is a thing. And, it, and it's not, you know, Interesting. That, that's the one thing I always tell my, my athletes, you know, you know, they come in, my knees hurt. Your, you know, your division one basketball player knees are going to hurt. You know, mm -hmm. your body is not going to stop hurting until you, until you're done. There's a difference between, you know, soreness and injury. You know, there, there is not, that's, you know, again, so yeah, having an athlete who takes care of his body, understands his body is, is great, but there's definitely a, you know, a, a spectrum, you know, when you, and you're on the far side that they won't do anything until they feel perfect, then that becomes a problem. If that makes sense, you know, yeah. and. Well, it's the, um, whole, it's the whole, are you, are you yeah. hurt or are you injured? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's. I think at the end of a basketball season, I think the team that probably wins and performs the best is probably the team that's also the healthiest. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, again, to you know, as a, a general statement, I, one of the hot, one of the most underrated piece of that is is taking care of your body. You know, it's it's our job to help you, um, you know, fuel your body in the best way we can, whether whether it's through modalities and rehab and strength and conditioning but the things that go unnoticed are nutrition and sleep and those are the things that kids are really failing at um mm -hmm. and i think one of the biggest problems is that they see what you know they see lebron james in the gym at 4 30 in the morning lebron james has a plethora of people to tell him what to do and help him with that stuff and, and again he he's also a freak of nature that, that they don't people don't grow like that um however he, he doesn't have to work at eight yeah he doesn't have to worry about school he doesn't have to worry about other things you know that mm. that is his job and so i think that's one of the challenging parts now is that you know high school athletes college athletes they see what the pros are doing and, and even we try to do the same stuff well this is what the Bulls are doing, this is what the Warriors are doing, this is what, you know, the Dolphins and the Patriots are doing. There's not enough time in the day for us to do that. You know, whether it's film study, whether it's practice, whether it's school, whether it's nutrition, whether it's rehab, whether it's conditioning, there's not enough time to do what, what the pros do with what demands student athletes have. So you have to, they, you have to figure that out. And that's, 
the importance of communicating with your coaching staff, the importance of communicating with your athletes, the importance of communicating with your parents. Um, just obviously times now are, are different. Um, but a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, we had a team Zoom meeting with our incoming freshman parents and, and, our, and some of our, our current parents. And so it was me and the coaching staff and the parents. And I, it, was, it was great because then, you know, Coach Cooley said, Chris, you know, what do you have for the parents? And that, you know, I went through the basic things to look for or what they're going to need when they come to campus. And then said, you know, times are different. You know, the kids need to realize that they need to sleep. They, they need recovery, you know, and it's not sleeping throughout the day. And what I always tell my, my athletes is that if you go to bed at two in the morning and wake up at, you know, 11, that's not the same as going to bed at 11 or 10 and getting up eight hours later, you know, eight hours isn't eight hours because of the cumulative effect, you know, that that's what they need to realize. And kids don't realize that. And, and then I've had a couple of kids that weren't feeling great and they started, you know, they, they shifted their schedule where they're going to bed at 11 and getting up at eight, you know, and they're like, wow, even though they're sleeping the same amount of time, they feel, you know, you, you think they're, you know, you're curing cancer. Mm-hmm. That's the one thing I try to preach to my guys is, your body has it, it is one of the best natural recoverers there is out there. You know, you can have all the modalities, the game ready is the Normatex, the massage therapy, the, you know, whatever you want, but your body will regenerate itself with rest. And that, you know, you, you do that. It makes our job a lot easier. It makes your, your life a lot easier from that standpoint and healthier. Um, you know, I think, um, if it's not apparent already, one of the um, guidelines, the reasons we have this podcast is to provide information from experts and parents and, you know, anyone who's involved in athletics alike um, to give parents and athletes information, uh, more resources, more resources, more understanding so that they can become better so they can make their kids better. Um, we had uh, Pat Hall, who's the uh, assistant baseball coach at uh, Central Connecticut State University on a couple podcasts ago. And I was trying to get a range of pitches that a pitcher would throw in a game um, in, in a week span uh, through the different age groups. And uh, Pat was good at, at, um, at, at describing that. And, you know, it was, it was, to give information because I thought it would be good for someone in, you know, either one of those boats in those age groups. But I, I did it for myself too, because, um, you know, with this whole coronavirus thing and, you know, the kids being home all the time, uh, I'm constantly giving my son, you know, uh, things to go do outside. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll program things out for him and he's mm-hmm. doing basketball, he's doing lacrosse, he's doing baseball. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's my kind of multiple sport diversification. Uh, but, I, I, you know, baseball said, especially pitching, I had a chicken wing. So I, I was no, I had no recollection or background in, in pitching whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And I think we as parents have to take a step back sometimes and realize what our strengths are and what they're not and reach mm-hmm. out to experts. Um, so after the day after the podcast, I started thinking about it a little more. I was like, you know, man, um, you know, Pat gave a range for a college athlete of like 115 pitches per game. And I had been given my son who's nine, he'll be 10 in September. Mm-hmm. I'd say, you know, all right, go take 50 uh, swings off the tee, do hundred jump shots, uh, 50, uh, uh, um, uh, 50 s- stick with your lacrosse on the left 50 and the right and 50 pitches. Mm-hmm. And then I started doing the math and I'm like, man, if that's every day, maybe, maybe he's doing a little too much. And I reached out to Pat. I'm like, Hey, you know, um, what are, what, you know, what, how many should he be, he be doing? And he went through a bunch of questions. He's like, mm-hmm. you know, what's the intensity? Um, uh, and, and, and afterwards he, he settled on, he said, okay. He said, uh, do 30 pitches on Monday, 50 pitches on Wednesday and 60 on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And going back to the podcast within that age group, you know, I think, you know, 50 or 60 was the most someone that age would throw if they were a pitcher. And I, I think he did it kind of, um, 
you know, just, just thinking back to my martial arts background, when you would see an MMA trainer, a, a lot of them would train their guys at night because they would end up fighting at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So I, I could see how he kind of did that periodization where he was ramping up through the week, Saturday, most likely the day a nine or 10 year old would pitch would be his most amount of pitches. And then going back around Monday would be the recovery day. I'm assuming so mm -hmm. to speak. So it was, um, we did the podcast Saturday. Um, Sunday was when I asked, reached out to him and it was Memorial day weekend. So I, I my mind was all fizzled. So I'm thinking it's Saturday. So he comes to me, I'm, I'm like, all right, go outside and give me 60 pitches. So he goes out and I'm in the front yard doing yard work and he comes around and his arms hanging. I'm like, what's the matter? He's like, my arm hurts. I'm like, how many did you do? He's like 50. I'm like, all right, go inside, ice it up and, and, and you're done for the day. And of course he went and played Xbox. He didn't ice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, all right, well, maybe I screwed up because maybe Pat told me to start tomorrow, which is Monday, but I'm all confused and mm -hmm. do 30 and ramp up. I told the kid to go do as many as he could right away. But, you know, I think that highlights what we as parents, you know, we make mistakes too. The whole idea is mm -hmm. just becoming more educated and more knowledgeable mm -hmm. and being able to help our kids with that. Uh, but Chris, I wanted to ask you specifically, what, what's going on in a nine-year-old who <laughs> throws a bunch of pitches full speed and his arms hanging? Um, and also, I guess, probably taking into account that He's definitely in a growth spurt. Um, mm -hmm. I took his height on on March 17th, and on May 15th, he'd, he'd grown a whole inch. So, mm -hmm. you know, I could see, you know, his arms is get, are getting longer. There, there's some, mm -hmm. He's definitely stretching out, so that, that's mm -hmm. taking place as well. Um, Good luck with that, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> to your point, he's, he's nine, you know, a nine-year-old isn't MLB ready. And I think that, I do think that sometimes parents get in their own way. You know, a kid needs, a, it needs time to be a kid. And that's the thing that I think we are failing to, to recognize. And, you know, I mean, it, I'm no different. Like, you know, we're going through, you know, my son's going to be three. And it's like, I want to be able to do this. Well, again, he's three. You know, his body is still developing. And, the, you know, the fear and the concern is, is that, you know, you you overwork your child to such such a young age, that can have ramifications down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, your body adapts to stresses. Your body is more you know likely to adapt when they're younger, and that's going to be a lifelong concern. You know, if his elbow gets loose because he was throwing, you know. 150 pitches a week when he was nine, that might not be something you're coming back from. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, and I, I look at it as, you know, when you're programming kids in the weight room, people in the weight room, you know, like, you know, we'll go back to bench. Everyone wants a big bench. To get a big bench, you don't just do bench, you work everything, you know, and throwing is such a specific motion to your arm and shoulder that you're going to cause damage because that's all you're it's all you're doing and it's not, it is not a natural motion it, it, it is not um you know so but you know again it's great that you're you're going out and you know programming your son to do some active stuff you know and right now is just it's just a weird time because he can't necessarily go out and play like he usually would because of the restrictions that we're all kind of facing and social distancing and you know and obviously you know we will get through this and we will be better and stronger however you know to, to your point and to many parents out there you know it's okay for them to not be focused on a sport um for a day you know and i do think that when you regiment someone that young so much they they might kind of grow into resentment for that because you know all I, all I did as a kid was, was pitch or all I did as a kid was I, I couldn't do anything until my parents told me I made, you know, 200 free throws. Um, you know, I, I had friends when I was younger that, you know, he, he had to make X amount of free throws before he came in. 
you know, by that, you know, by the point time he got to high school, he was, he was over basketball. He was done, you know, and I, I, yeah, I don't know the specifics to um, Del Donna, who the NBA, the WNBA player who was, you know, I had a top recruit was going to go to UConn and she, she said, I'm done. You know, she went to Delaware and, and played volleyball. I mean, came back to it, and obviously she's she she's good. Um, <laughs> but that I think that's one of the things that we as parents fail at. That we want our kids to be the best at whatever they're doing. They need to be able to figure out what they're going to be best at. Yeah, I and I agree with you a hundred percent. And you know, I think more than than getting him to be good at something. What I'm trying to do is teach him how to program his own workouts. Mm -hmm. Cause I, you know, a lot of times I think athletes get to a certain point and they don't know how to do that. And, you know, Mm -hmm. once you're getting up into, you know, high school, especially college, Mm -hmm. you've got to, you've got to be a a programmer. You've got to be able to, you know, do your own workouts, whether that's skill or, or strength and conditioning, if you want to succeed. Um, so I don't I don't know that I but I don't know that I agree with that sentiment. Um simply because in today's day and age, there are there's more resources at the high school level. There's more resources for that. And that's what you know, that's what Mark's job is. Mark's job is a strength and conditioning coach. You know, if everyone learned how to program themselves, then what's the point of having a strength and conditioning coach? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah but, you're, you're, but you're I don't think every, and, and, yeah, no, I, I get, get what you're saying, but everyone's okay. not at going to be at that level. And in order to get to that level, you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to get an advantage somehow. Mm-hmm. But you also, have, you, you do, but you also have to trust the people that you're working with, you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't do my own taxes because there's tax specialists, you know? <laughs> like that that to me and the mindset is that and then you know you want your kid to have an advantage which is fine however you might it might be a disadvantage because what you think you're programming your child to do might not be right for him you know you, you're you're programming him to what you think he should be you know and and and, 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 and you correct yes and that's not you know like he might not be a pitcher so why worry about pitches when he could be worried, you know, he could be doing tosses versus pitching, you know, and, 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 that, and that kind of mindset. I, I do think that we do live in a society now where, like I said, everyone is focused on that scholarship money or the, the league, you know, let it play out a little bit and, you know, let them, let them pick and choose what they want to do. Because again, physiologically, your body is developing, you know, he, he, he's grown an inch or two or three, but that's, that could be where he stops. We, you don't know. We don't know. And I think that that's, you know, you know, you look at you know, one of the wildest sports is, is, is swimming. You know, swimming is, is, is insane. It, you know, the, the, the hours that you put in to become a, a pro- professional swimmer is, is wild. And I don't necessarily know it's the healthiest because, you know, you're swimming at all hours of the day and that's just overuse. But, you know, and Mark, and you can attest to this, how many swimmers have you seen that, and, and again, and I had this conversation with my wife about it, you know, and, you know, Michael Phelps has a, has a great swimmer's body and he is proportionate because he's had people tell him whatever. But if you're not an elite level swimmer and you swim, swim your whole life, like your, your shoulders, you're going to have that rounded back because you didn't do the proper techniques, but all you thought you had to do was swim. I just swam and swam and swam and swam and swam. You know, so you need to be able to find that balance with, you know, so you don't have long lasting issues. You know, so, you know, that's, you know, I think letting, you know, letting science kind of play out, letting the way your child develops play out. And, you know, again, activity is, is, is paramount. I, I think it's, it's super important. I think outside play is the best thing you can do. I think the Xbox play is, it, it's annoying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not, I make, shoot, I've got my kids, not my, my athletes, I have to like throw their phone in the, in the cold tub so they can, you know, they, so they pay attention to me. Um, that that probably didn't go over too well. No, <laughs> uh, that's what I say. You know, next time I see your phone, I want to play the game and see how waterproof your phone is. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean that that's that's you know again to to your point, I do think that we as a society we think we know what's best for our kids. We, we, you know, to a to a degree we do. However, you know, let them kind of figure out what they're going to be good at. You know, you might want them to be a pitcher, but he could be a better lacrosse player or a better football player or 
or hockey or or whatever. So I think I think a, a good base is fine, but I, I I I'm not of the mindset to, you know, a nine year old needs to figure out how he's going to program when he gets to high school. Let that play out uh, as it is. I, you know. Again, I, I I'm I'm with you a hundred percent. I I I don't care if my kid wants to, <laughs> you know, learn how to do needling. It, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I, I, I love them and, you know, yep. but, you know, it's, yep. it's, it's finding that balance as parents mm-hmm. where we guide yes. them, push them yep. a little bit, but not, not do too much, you Correct. know, and so that they experience a bunch of different things. Yeah. So they do find what they love and I agree. regardless of what they, they love, they apply the same principles, mm-hmm. you know, yes. hard work, being smart, yes. you know, what? Yep. treating people right. So that, mm-hmm. that's the whole idea. Yeah. No, I, 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 you know, again, I'm not questioning your parenting styles by, by any means, but I, I do, I am. again, <laughs> 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 um, I, you know, that's, that's the thing I think that people need to understand is that it's okay that, you know, your seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, you know, you don't, you know, you don't need to put your eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old in the weight room because that, you know, you, you're probably going to do more harm than good. Mm. So if you're not going to put them in the weight room at that age, you don't necessarily need to worry about their programming at that age either. That, that, that's, that, that's my point. You know, like just, it, it's not just throwing, you know, you, you're, you know, and to, whether it's pitching, whether it's, you know, whether it's football, whether it's whatever it is, it's, it's making sure they have a, you know, a wide range of stuff to, so that their body develops naturally. You know, you know, when you, when you start counting pitches or, you know, lax tosses or, or whatever, again, where's the rest of the day for them to do them? You know, so if it's, everything's regimented then, then in your, or let your body just naturally develop. Well, that's, the, the whole, that's the whole the thing reason, thing. the whole reason before was yeah. not to overtrain. That's, you yeah. know, that's the reason because, you know, like I said, I, you know, my, with my own ignorance, I don't know what those numbers are. And I'm mm-hmm. sure a lot of other parents out there don't. Yeah. So in order for me to control that, so he doesn't go into mm-hmm. that overtraining, that's mm-hmm. why I wanted to fill that gap in my own knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, oh. That, 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 that's, that's great that you're, you're finding that, you're finding that out and asking the people that be, you know, but again, when he gets into high school, he will have guidance from a coach. You know, the person that you ask for his guidance now is the person he's going to be. He, I think it's more important for athletes, you know, young, young kids to understand the importance of asking for help than figuring out on their own that I need to throw, I need to throw X amount of things per day because I think that becomes more of the mental health issue that if they don't throw that many in that day, they feel like they're failing. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah. absolutely. And that's 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 one of the things that you know, with our mental health stuff, like you know, that's we're trying to find the balance of giving kids enough stuff to do while they're home, so they they do stay busy and they stay kind of, yeah, I'm doing this to better myself, but you don't want to give them too much because if they don't accomplish it, then that kind of sets them back, saying, oh, why 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 can't I do this? Why why you know what's going on? And so it's it, it's a it's a it's a balance act. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, our exchange that we just had, it was exactly what we're trying to do with this. You know, these are, these are tough questions that need to be brought up and need to be discussed because, you know, there is this, not to use it again, but this carrot dangling in front of everyone, especially parents, you know, to do this. And we all got to find out, we all got to come to a a mind meld and find Mm -hmm. where the right way to go is for our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Go ahead, Mark. I think, you know, I've talked, as I've said, I've, over the last couple of months, I've talked to a bunch of coaches. And for like the basketball players that you work with, this is the first time probably in the last eight years of their life, if they're a senior, that they've had an extended period of time to recover and take a break from basketball. There's nobody telling them to get shots up. There's nobody telling them to get in the weight room. There's nobody giving them conditioning drills that they have to get done. So what's going to happen when these athletes come back and they're better because they've actually had time away? Mm-hmm. You know, what, what, what's the plan that you, Coach White and Coach Cooley, have put together um, to make sure that when they come back that 
they're not hitting the ground at 100 miles per hour because they can't hit the ground at 100 miles per hour because mm -hmm. they haven't even gone 30 miles per hour in the last two months. That's, I mean, that's, you know, from day one, that's kind of been my fear. Um, you know, and I do, I do hope that they come back feeling better, you know, and that would be great. You know, I, I think we've gotten away from the less is more sensation or, or belief. And more is more. More is better. And I, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that we've gotten to a point in, in life where, you know, we are it nonstop. But if you, you know, if you look at, you know, I, I find it funny that we, as the NCAA in high school, like to emulate what the NBA stars are doing or what the NFL stars are doing. But no one ever talks about the fact that, you know, the NFL has a mandatory offseason where you, there's no contact with the coaching staff and the strength staff, uh, you know, so there is that natural kind of off season. And so some of the stuff that, I, you know, I've, I've watched a couple of kind of, you know, webinar type deals and, you know, they had some strength coaches on from the Lions and, you know, you know, everyone's worried about what's going to happen when kids, when everyone comes back. Well, you know, the NFL basically has a, a has two off seasons where they're, they're kind of prepped for it. Um, but for me, from, you know, so again, they do take time off. Collegially, there is not a lot of time off. Depending on what sport it is, if you look at track and cross country, there is no off season. Swimming, there really is not an off season. You know, I do think that there's a failure of oversight. You know, with those sports, even baseball. Baseball is wild. You know, you know, you play your you play your season, and then you go play a summer season. So they never stop. Um, but you know. We always want to watch basketball, and watch football because well, they're, they're the big money. They're the big money makers, and you're making sure that they're doing everything right. But you know, to your point, Mark, the fear is you know they are running on their own. They're doing stuff on their own. But when you come back, our coach is going to be able to realize that they're not where we where we were at. Um, so we need to kind of work their way back. And the stuff that we've been talking about is you know, one to two weeks of trying to get back into it, of, of whether it's just strength and conditioning. And again, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be able to open the gym, the strength, the, you know, the weight room for those numbers. So that, that's one moving piece. Um, but it's not just because not everyone's going to have access to the same stuff. You know, some places are you know utilizing the division three model where they go home with some of this. So they're not on campus all year and they, you know, and, and they're fine. But also to that point, most Division three athletes, when you know we're not in in lockdown, have access to weight rooms and have access to gyms. They're doing stuff. Here is different. Not everyone has access to a gym right now. Not everyone has access to stuff at home. Um, so the, you know the importance is you know it's not just running. Running, running great, but running isn't basketball. Running isn't football. Change of direction is all sports. If you're not doing change of direction stuff or doing explosive stuff that's when injury occurs, you know, whether it's the Achilles, whether it's, you know, hamstring, whether it's your knee. And that's what is so important. That's why, you know, Kenny and I talk a lot about that, what we're going to do when we come back. Um, and, you know, back, back to the initial piece, this initial piece is the is relationship and the communication that you have with your strength coach that, you know, yeah, we want to get him back and playing, but we need to make sure it's safe and make sure that, you know, we don't want to spike an injury. Because I know that a couple of years ago when the NFL strike happened, they had a spike in injuries because of, you know, guys weren't doing stuff they could have done or should have done or, or, or just, just happenstance, you know? Um, so that's what I want to avoid, you know? I love wins, I hate lo losing, but that's not my job, you know? And that, you know, I, I need to make sure the athletes are safe. And that's what we're trying to figure out as, as a collective team, you know, with my staff and the strength staff and, you know, counterparts across the country. You know, this is the one time, you know, I almost want to say the most unified you've been with you know sharing what you know the Pac-12 is doing what the ACC is doing what you know UConn is doing what we're doing what you know Michigan is doing what you know everyone's kind of in the same boat trying to make you know for the protection of the general population the student athletes so to you know specifically we don't have a plan yet we're working on it because we don't have a return date yet okay but when that happens we are going to have stuff in place so to protect the health and wellness of our kids I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways from this for me is that 
you know, everybody is sharing information and everybody is coming together for the common good of the student athletes. And mm -hmm. it's not so much, you know, in my, in my, in my field, we're not arguing about, you know, do you, do you front squat or do you back squat anymore? Yep. I mean, I, I guess the big one that came out last week, do you, do you recover with your hands on your head or your hands on your yeah. knees? What's better? Yeah. Like who get like at the end of the day, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, but like, I think you you started in the profession uh, a little after I did, mm -hmm. and when I I got into it, it was eight hours of strength and conditioning and no basketball. Mm -hmm. Now they play pickup every day, yep. Um, and usually the coach's office is right over the right over the the gym, so mm -hmm. the coach knows if they're playing pickup or not. Mm -hmm. um, but do you foresee when they come back that they're being like a shift because right now it's four and four do you, do you foresee coaches giving the strength and conditioning and the sports medicine side the hours that they need in order to make sure that these athletes are where they need to be before yeah, the yeah, and that's one of, that's one of the things that we're talking about you know and you know so the coaches are aware you know and i hope so but you know it, 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 this this is this is not indictment on my coaches specifically just in, in in general everyone it's easy you know in a vacuum everything's perfect but it's going to come to a point where people or the coaches want to you know we got we, we got practice we got practice we got practice and so i think initially everything is going to be smooth and then they're going to want to push and push and push so they can so they can go um you know i you know i think I think there could be, I, I, it would be nice to see a swing kind of back, but again, I think time will tell and we'll see, but I do hope that the one, the one positive piece that comes out of this whole, you know, coronavirus is that we are able to take a look back and see that, you know, maybe we didn't have any, everything in check and, you know, there are some things that could be corrected. And I know, you know, for, for Providence College Sports Medicine, we were able to take time to look at our area and what we're doing and saying oh well we're a little short here so we need to work on that and you know so I, so collectively globally I, I don't know I hope so but there's also a time when money talks so so we'll we'll, we'll see um I'm hopeful also, it'll, it'll swing back a little bit but we'll, you know I don't I don't I don't know yet I don't have the answer to that yet well and also co the coaches they've been they haven't been recruiting and okay. they haven't been coaching correct so they've been sitting, I mean, I could only imagine what Coach Cooley's like right now. I mean, he's probably like a pent-up freaking tiger just ready to pounce. I mean, happy birthday to Narice, uh <laughs> Coach Cooley's wife. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, we started the conversation today on the importance of communication. And it's not only between sports medicine and strength and conditioning, but also with the head coaches. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have those open and honest um, dialogues that both parties might not agree upon. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's really a time where you're going to see how your relationship is with your head coach. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, he, he does get paid to win games. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you have three guys blow out their Achilles uh, because you decided to slam on the gas right as the kids got on campus, you know, you have three kids down with Achilles. Well, they're out for the year. Mm -hmm. Good luck winning games without three of your starters. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't, yeah. wish that for, I don't wish that for anybody, but at the, I think it's, I think it's right now our profession, you know, not only as sports medicine, but as strength and conditioning, you're really going to see how, strong your relationship is mm -hmm. with your coaches and how much value they have or lack of value that they have with your professional expertise in your field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, no, it, be, it, it's going to be interesting. You know, that's the thing. And it's been good so far. Um, you know, just we touch base every now and then right now. And, you know, coaches, you know, I, I've been fortunate to work with some really great coaches, you know, and I've worked with, with some very intense coaches, but at the end of the day, you know, they do care about the kids and that's that's important for me you know from a quality of life for myself you know and um 
so it's it's good. It it can get tough at times, but at, at the end of the day, I think you, everyone has to be on the same page, and it's it it kind of it is like that here, you know, which is great, you know. And I, I think, you know, back to one of your original pieces, you know, what do you what do you tell the general pop, you know, public what you're looking into? And it's not my job to recruit kids. It's not my job to, have to tell kids to come to school here or or wherever. But parents, make sure you know, don't just look at don't just look at the name on the jersey. Don't just look at the swag that you get. Don't just look at that stuff. Look at the culture. Look at the importance of where you're going to be sending your kids, you know, and and who you're getting involved with. That's more important than, you know, the name on the front of the jersey. You know, and I do. I think that's – I think we do have an issue right now with transfers and all that stuff, but – but you, if you take the time to really look into where you're deciding to go to school, that's more important. I always, I always tell, I always tell the athletes, would you go to that school if your coach wasn't there or if you couldn't play your sport? And if the answer is no, then don't go there. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. care what the coach is telling, telling yep. you. I mean, we've, we've all been around coaches. Mm -hmm. And, I, I mean, Coach Cooley is probably one of the best salesmen that I know. I believe he could sell ice to an Eskimo. Um, and, and, and I mean that as a compliment. I mean, I, I, I totally do. I mean, um, but at the, at the same time, I mean, would you, would you go to that institution if your coach wasn't there or if you couldn't play your sport and would you be happy there? Because yeah. if you're not going to be happy there, it doesn't matter. Right. You're going to, you're going to be, you're not going to be the nicest person to be around and nobody's going to want you there anyway. So, yeah. All right, guys, when I say we leave it there. Perfect. That was a great, great podcast. Chris, thanks for coming on, man. Well, I appreciate it. That was fun. Where can Chris, if people get in contact with you if they want to? Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can, you know, shoot me an email. You know, like I, I was telling these guys before, I don't have much of a presence on social media except for my family. <laughs> um, but, yeah, my – My son's email, got great squat form, by the way. <laughs> like most three-year-olds teaching them young yeah you know uh my email is chris dot hageman at gmail.com c-h-r-i-s dot h-a-g-e-m-a-n-n -N at gmail.com awesome all right well thanks for coming on chris good luck to you this upcoming season i appreciate um, it fellas this is fun and remember, uh, if you're if you're a parent or a, a college bound or college hopeful athlete, listen to your athletic trainer and your strength and conditioning coach. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. If you want to reach out to us, if you got questions, uh, if you want to come on as a guest, info at athletehackers.com. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Google Podcasts. Uh, you can look through our previous podcasts on athletehackers.com. And we're also up on YouTube if you want to and see our pretty YouTube. faces. <laughs> I got I got a face I got a face for podcasts, not YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening, everyone. Peace. All my best. God bless. Have a great week. Yeah. See ya. Yeah.